Welcome, my name is Deborah Walker, and I'm speaking to you from Revival from Down Under, which is a Christian church located in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, Australia. So I'd like to welcome you all here today, and those watching online, delighted to have you with us. And today I'd like to speak on a topic called God's Financial Blessing. God's Financial Blessing. And God created this wonderful world by speaking words of faith. And he created you. And you have been created in the image of God. And God desires you to walk this walk by faith. Faith is we're not relying on our natural senses. Faith is we are relying on God's word. And God has given us his word so that we may know his will for creation. That's your life, my life. And I'm just going to turn to Revelation. I'm opening my King James Bible to Revelation chapter 4. And we read here in verse 11. And it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Praise God. So that includes you and me, and we are created for God's pleasure. And if we turn back to Ephesians chapter 1, and we read here in verse 5, and it says here, Ephesians 1 verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So God, once we become believers, we've been adopted into God's family. That's part of his good pleasure, his will for your life. And God is a faithful and wonderful heavenly father who loves you and me, and he provides for his children. And what pleasures or what pleases the Father? Faith. And what is faith? Faith is having an expectation, believing, trusting, relying on, and having confidence in God. And a good definition of faith is knowing that God meant what he said in his word. I'll say it again. Faith is God know and believing and knowing that God meant what he said in his word. And how do we get faith? We know from Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And God's word is the Bible and God's words are written down so all can read. And we understand God's word and his ways through his word, the Bible. And God has created this world and he's made provision for his creation. And the keys to receiving God's provision are uh, believing his word and obeying his word as shown in the Bible. And again, God meant what he said. For example, if your father made a will, and that's a document that has legal and binding consequences, it cannot be altered or changed in any way because it's your father's will. And it contains his will written down so the readers know his intention. And the will has within it text advising what has been provided for you as a beneficiary, as part of his estate. Well, God's word, the Bible, is his will. And a will is a testament or a covenant. And the Bible contains the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it contains God's promises for those who will believe. All right. And if we turn to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22. And regarding God's word, we read in Revelation 22 verses 18 and 19. It says, For I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So God's word cannot be altered or changed. 
And if anyone tries to, there will be eternal and serious consequences to them. Let's turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119 and verse 160. Psalm 119 and verse 160. And we read here, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgment endures forever. God's word is true from the beginning. And also, I'll read it in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 25. It says here, 1 Peter 1, 25. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The word of the Lord endures forever. It does not change. It cannot be altered. It's gone out of his mouth and it shall not return to him void. He's spoken it into being and it's been written down just so we know his intention. This is his will. All right. And we as the believers are the beneficiaries of the will. And so how can one know what God has made available to them? We need to read the will. We need to read the Bible. And we read in Psalm 103. Let's turn back there. Psalm 103. Psalm 103 and verse 2. And it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And that word benefit, it means an act of good and implies reward and recompense. And so serving God comes with benefits. And we'll just read on there. At verse 3, it says, Who forgives all thine iniquities, that's a benefit. Who heals all thy diseases, that's definitely a benefit. Who redeems thy life from destruction. Who crowns thee with loving kindness and tender mercies who satisfies thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagle. And the Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. All right, God is for you. Praise God. And we just turn back to Psalm 68. Psalm 68. And it says here in verse 19, Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits. Even the God of our salvation, Selah. He daily loads us with benefits. Some we may know, we may, re, may, we may be aware of, and others we may not be aware of. You know, we could, have a, uh, we could be driving in traffic and have a near miss, or someone, and, and you know, we don't get involved in the accident, or someone might be going to um, enter someone's home, um, but they won't enter your home. They'll enter maybe somebody else's home to rob it. All right, near misses. God wants to look after his own and he does, praise God. And he daily loads us with benefits. And benefits, they are to be received. Just like when a person leaves a company, some companies give them a benefit or a function. And the person is on the receiving end of the benefit. Benefits have to be received. And receiving benefits is similar to receiving blessings. And this topic is called God's financial blessing. And that word blessing in scripture, it means good fortune and supernatural favor and success. Doesn't that sound good? Good fortune, supernatural favor and success. People in the world want that. But God provides it for the believers. All right. And spiritually, do we see people in the scripture that we're financially blessed. There's a principle in the word of God, first the natural and second the spiritual. And in scripture, we read of natural Israel, speaking of the natural Jew. And there's also spiritual Israel, speaking of the spiritual Jew, the church, that's us. And we have been grafted into the ch God's, God's people through Jesus Christ. And we're just going to look at Abraham. And if we turn over to Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4. Scripture shows that Abraham is the father of all who believe. We read in Romans chapter 4 verse 11 and it says here, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he, this is Abraham, might be the father of all them that believe, though he 
though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So Abraham, he was before the law, all right? And we are the seed of Abraham through Jesus Christ. And in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, where we are, for it says, for what says the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And the Amplified says, verse 3, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed in, he trusted in God, and it was credited to his account as righteousness, right living and right standing with God. And that's what happens to us. When we turn to the Lord, we believe in faith. And it's not about works that we got saved, but it's by faith. By faith we stand. And originally, Abraham's name was Abram. And God spoke to Abram. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. And just start there in verse 1. And it says here, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee. And make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curses thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Right? That was God's promise, not just to the natural Israel, but all the families of the earth. That's God's plan. And this is what God required of Abram. And God was looking for Abram's obedience so he could bless him. And then in chapter 13, just in verses 1 and 2, it says, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And then chapter 24, chapter 24 and verse 1, it says here, And Abraham was, this is so time's gone on, And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Not just some things, but all things. And further we read uh, in, down in verse 35, Abraham had a servant. And we read in verse 35 what the servant said of Abraham. He said, And the Lord has blessed my master greatly, and he has become great, and he has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants, camels and asses. So who blessed Abraham? We just read it. It said the Lord blessed him. All right. The blessings come from the Lord. And why was Abraham blessed? Let's just turn back to Genesis 22, 22 and verse 18. It says here what the Lord said, And in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. What's God's voice? It's his word. And so Abraham, he obeyed God, and so God blessed him. And then we also read in Genesis that Abraham had a son called Isaac. And so it's Genesis 26, Genesis 26, we read here in verse 1. And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And in famine is a time of lack. And Isaac may have been tempted to go back to Egypt. However, we read what the Lord says, verse 2. And the Lord appeared unto him. So the Lord appeared to Isaac and he said unto him, Go not down to Egypt. Egypt speaks of the world. Go not down to Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land and I will be with thee and will bless thee. And for unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. And I will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. It's the same thing. What happened to Abraham? 
was now going to be happening to Isaac. Praise God. Shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And so what did Isaac do in this time of lack, in this time of famine? Just down in verse 12. Let's read it here. It says, And then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. Why was Isaac blessed? Isaac did what God told him to do, just like his father. And verse 24, it says, And the Lord appeared unto him the same night. So here's the Lord appearing again to him. And he said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. So for us to be blessed, even favoured by God, we also need to obey God's word, right? Because we are the spiritual seed of Abraham, all right? And, um, and I'm just going to, in this topic, I'm going to give a couple of testimonies. But the first one was, um, there was a, a number of years ago, I was selling a property. And at the time, there was a serious downturn in the building industry, in the, in the housing market. And we had some uh, real estate people come in and give a quote for what they thought they, the house was valued at and what they could sell it for. And that wasn't the figure I had in mind at all. In fact, it was very short of what I had in mind. And I thought, well, no, what did Isaac do? And this was the very scripture that came to me. Isaac sowed in the time of famine. All right, so the offering came and I had a figure in my mind that I thought that was what the value of the property was, regardless of what these real estate people were saying. But I had a figure in my heart and I thought, right, well, I'm going to connect my faith with this. And I actually sowed a seed into the offering, it was a significant seed, but I put it in the offering, believing God for that amount. I put this much in, it was small in comparison, but it was significant seed, naming it, thank you, Lord, I'm sowing this seed, believing that as I sow this seed, the property, we're going to reap that much. And I did it by faith, put it in the offering, and did the house sell that week? No. Did the house sell that month? No. Three months, six months. It even got to, tw and I kept praying and kept saying, thank you, Lord, for the sale of the property for this amount. I just kept saying it. This is the amount. Thank you, Lord, for selling the property for that amount. And, um, and 12 months went past. And of course, Isaac, he got the hundredfold within the 12 months. I already hit the 12 months and it still hadn't sold. Now, I could have quit, but I thought, no, I've sown a seed. I've committed myself to it, and I'm going to keep believing God. And it wasn't long after the 12 months that um, some people came in and said uh, they were interested in the property, and they were just under the amount. And the real estate guys, the real estate man was saying, look, you need to take this amount. You need to take it. Take it. It's really good. It's really good. And I thought, no, it's not what I'm believing for. And, uh, and I just said, no. No, this is the figure. And I just stood my ground and they came back with, oh, all right. And so doing it God's way, there was an extra 600,000 in the sale, doing it God's way. And so glory to God. He wants to bless his children and it takes faith and believing and not quitting, just giving thanks is really important. All right, let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 1 and 2. And it says here, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. All right, the condition to receiving the blessings is that we hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord, which is his word, and that we obey it. We, we put it into, into practice. We obey his word. And when we do that, 
then the text following on chapter 28 it, or the text that says that the those people that do it that way are blessed in every area of their lives this is the god's promise they'd be blessed in the city in the field in the in procreation that's having children crops livestock finances safe traveling victory over all the enemy and whatsoever they put your hand to and plenteous in goods and lend and not borrow the head not the tail and that god would open his good treasure the rain <laughs> and the rain in your land in his season and meaning that God will give you understanding of his word hallelujah that's what the rain is in good season praise God because rain speaks of the word of God hallelujah so there was going to be blessing flowing into these people if they would just do it God's way hallelujah and with God's help may we listen to his word and obey it amen and then in verse 15 and 16, we read here, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And it goes on, and um, cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field. And it goes on. And then so it follows a great number of curses, which will be activated in every part of a disobedient person's life. Because if people want to go their own way, what can God do? It allows the enemy to come in and steal, kill and destroy. But when we go God's way, God's blessings can come on our lives. And so unfortunately, a disobedient person, the pathway that they're on does not lead to heaven until they repent. All right. So we want to be on God's pathway and um, and be listening to his word and obeying his word and so we read a wonderful exhortation and warning let's turn to job chapter 36 job just before psalms job 36 job 36 and it says here in verse 10 it says he opened also their ear to discipline and commanded that they should return from iniquity. The Amplified says, He also opens their ears to instruction and discipline and commands that they return from iniquity. So may our ears be open to hear God's correction as He adjusts us, all right? And that we turn away from iniquity, right? Because God wants to bless. Right, so we need to have ears that hear. And verse 11 and 12, it says, And if they obey and serve him, serve the Lord, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. Pleasures, plural. But if they obey not, they shall perish by the sword and they shall die without knowledge. The Amplified says, verse 11, If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasantness and joy. Hallelujah. But if they obey not, they shall perish by the sword of God's destructive judgments and they shall die in ignorance of true knowledge. Wow, it's quite serious. So when we go God's way, he wants that blessing to follow. Praise God. Let's turn to Psalm 1, just, just over the page there. Psalm 1. Let's start verse 1. It says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's God's word. And in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he does shall prosper. Verse 4, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. All right, so God, he's, uh, he's so merciful, but because he is love, love always gives freedom of choice. So God does want us to choose his way. But if we, do, if we choose not to follow his ways, then there are consequences. 
But for us, we are blessed when we conform our lives to God's word. Uh, Psalm 35, Psalm 35. And it says here, let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Praise God. What a great scripture. Let me read it again. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Remember we read right at the beginning, we were created for his pleasure. It gives him pleasure to prosper us. And I believe God's, um, oh, I was going to say, it doesn't give God pleasure to see people in lack or starving or experiencing poverty. That doesn't bless the heart of God. However, God's kingdom operates by faith and faith comes from the word. And I believe God's righteous cause, let them shout that have glad that favor my righteous cause. I believe God's righteous cause is the gospel because God's not willing that any should perish. And so supporting the gospel includes prayer and finances. And so at offering time, we need to be glad and lifting our voices and shouting for joy. It's a delight to give into the gospel because your very offering might be the very one that reaches through God's ministries and however he gets it out there, that that person makes it to heaven. You know, God is just, there are people out there waiting on your and my obedience to God. They're waiting because they're waiting to be saved. And it takes finances to get, it, to get them, to reach them. Some, some, uh, some are reached through the gospel and crusades and so forth or online or how or different ways. And others just uh, might have someone come up to them. But whatever it is, it's a sacrifice of time and it usually takes money as well. But it's not about money. It's about willingness to support God's work. All right. And God looks on the heart and it says here, let them s let the Lord be magnified. All right. To magnify the Lord is to see him bigger. We need to magnify the Lord and see him bigger than whatever situation we may be looking at. We have, to we have to get our eyes off our situation and off ourselves and get them onto the Lord and just see him bigger. All right. Praise Lord. And that word pleasure that have pleasure in my uh, which which has pleasure. So the Lord has pleasure. The, that word pleasure, the Lord has pleasure. It means he delights. He desires and he wants to favor. So God delights. He desires and he has favor towards you. That's what it just said. Let the Lord be magnified, which has pleasure in the prosperity. It, he wants to delight and favor you. That's what it says. And that word prosperity in the prosperity of his servant, that is such an all encompassing word in the Hebrew. It means healing, well-being, wholeness, health, wealth, welfare and prosperity. It's just one word, but it has all those meanings. So it's not all about money. It's about our whole life. And God wants to bless every area. And the Oxford Dictionary says prosperity means flourishing, successful and thriving. That sounds good too, doesn't it? And so we just read in this scripture, let them say continually. Our words are powerful. We know that life and death in the power of the tongue. Our words are powerful. So what are we saying continually? Are we speaking or even thinking about lack? Or this hasn't happened or that happened and so forth. In Proverbs 23 verse 7, it says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As he thinks in his heart. So is he. So rather than thinking about lack and what hasn't happened, we need to be encouraging ourselves in the Lord by saying and thinking, for example, I magnify the Lord. I see him bigger than my situation. The Lord has pleasure in my prosperity and his blessings are flowing into my life. Sound good? Sounds much better than grumbling and complaining. All right, we need to agree with God's word and we need to be thinking in agreement with God's word. 
All right. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to God. All right. So what we're saying and what we're thinking needs to line up with the word of God. And another key to receiving from God is that we are thankful for what we already have. We need to be thankful for what we already have. If we have breath, praise God. If we're going to heaven, praise God. If we have strength, if we have eyes, if we have ears, if we, if we have limbs, if we have a house, if we have clothing, we need to be thankful for what we already have. Because thanksgiving makes a way for God to do more in our lives. If we're not grateful for what we've got already, think about it. Like, you know, some of you are probably parents and you have children and, you know, you don't want them sort of taking you for granted and, and they don't care what you do and they don't care that you've provided for them and they just don't care. That's the attitude. Well, you know, <laughs> you can just take a little bit longer before you give them a bit more exciting things in their life. You know, God wants us to be thankful for what we already have, grateful for what we already have. And as I said, thanksgiving makes a way for God to en enlarge us. Praise God. And let's turn to Psalm 112. Psalm 112. Let's start there in verse 1. And it says here, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that fears the Lord. That means having a reverential fear of the Lord that delights greatly in his commandments. Right? We need to be delighting ourselves in the word of God. He seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Right? That's God's word. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house and his righteousness endures forever. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man shows favor and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in God, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he sees desire upon his enemies. He has dispersed, he has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. The wicked shall see it and be grieved. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. All right, the desire of the wicked is going to perish, but the desire of the righteous, God wants to bless. God wants to bless. And so God is for you. And as you walk in his way, he will ensure you are in the right place at the right time for his plans to come to pass in your life. Praise God. Praise God. And we also know um, in Malachi, you know, we are to be giving tithes and offerings. And when we do, the windows of heaven are opened and the blessings of the Lord chase us down and he rebukes the enemy. So, of course, we want the enemy rebuked. All right. So we do it God's way. And that's one of the promises. Just go over to Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs 10. And it says here in verse 22. The blessing of the Lord, it makes rich and he adds no sorrow with it. Praise God. The blessing of the Lord makes rich and he adds no sorrow. Praise God. The blessing of the Lord does not come through toiling, but rather through believing that God loves us. He loves you and he wants to bless you. And for example, as a young child, my loving parents would ask me what I would like for my birthday. And I always had an answer and a particular doll and so on. And once I gave them my answer, I did not worry about the doll or lose sleep over the doll or get discouraged that the doll had not arrived as yet. The doll was not scheduled to arrive until my birthday. There was nothing that I had to do but to rest in my parents' love for me because I knew they loved me. 
They provided for me. They clothed me. They looked after me. They fed me. They just loved me. So I could just rest in that and not worry. And so how much more has God proven his love for us by sending Jesus? And God loves each one of us. And as we listen and obey and serve him, obey his word and serve him, he desires to bless us and give us the desire of our heart. Like my parents, that was the desire of my heart, a particular doll, right? And so they wanted to give me that doll because it was the desire of my heart. When I wanted to sell that property, that was the desire of my heart. I needed to sell that property, right? And so God did that. But I kept, you know, I was a rest of faith. Keep believing and resting in faith. And let's turn to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. And verse 3. And it says here, trust in the Lord. It's so simple to say that, isn't it? Trust in the Lord. But I think that's a growing thing. We can sometimes trust him for small things, but maybe not the bigger things, or maybe we're not even up to trusting him with the small things. But God wants to trust, to trust him, trust him for all things. Trust in the Lord and do good. Don't, don't do bad. It says do good. And so thou shalt dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of your heart. What a promise. If you delight yourself in the Lord, he's going to give you the desires of your heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. It's pretty encouraging, isn't it? That's what he wants to do. Let's read it from the Amplified. Trust, lean on, rely on and be confident in the Lord and do good. So shall you dwell in the land and feed surely on his faithfulness and truly you shall be fed. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he will give you the desires and secret petitions of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, roll and repose each care of your load on him. Trust, lean on, rely on and be confident also in him and he will bring it to pass. So that word commit your way, you're just giving it to him, rolling it. Lord, this is the situation. I don't know what to do here or you're going to show me what to do here. But Lord, I'm just giving it to you. We've got to commit it to him and leave it with him. And then he will show us if we need to do anything or whatever else might be involved. All right. But we've got to give. We're not the burden carrier. He's the burden carrier. We just give things to him. All right. And he wants to lead and guide us. All right, so we need to commit all things to the Lord and continue to trust him at all times. And he can be trusted. He's God Almighty. He's got this whole planet worked out. He's the author and the finisher. He's the beginning and the end. He sees it all. He knows how many even hairs are on your head. He knows everything about you. And he knows exactly the situation you are in. And he wants you to look to him. All right. Praise God. He can be trusted and he has everything, including your life, in his hands. All right. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. It says here. For it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's all about God's good pleasure. We're just a part of the plan. All right. And the Amplified says, verse 13, not in your own strength, for it is God who is all the while effectually at work in you. Energizing and creating in you the power and the desire both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. Sometimes we think, oh, I've got this idea. Do you know where it came from? God. He, he puts the ideas in our heart when it's, you know, it's him. I mean, I'm not talking about the enemy's ideas and false and lies, but those desires we think, oh, this would be, actually it's God who's put the desire in there. All right, so he's doing it and it's his, it's his plan and we just get to flow with it. And uh, I was just going to say regarding my loving parents, it gave them pleasure to bless me. And so as believers, 
it gives our loving Heavenly Father great pleasure to bless us. If you understand the Father's heart, we are his children and he wants to take care of us and bless us just like our natural parents do. And let's turn over to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. And scripture tells us that God hastens his word to perform it. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 12. It says here, Then says the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. The Amplified says, Then said the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. All right, God is watching over his word to perform it. So God's on the lookout. He's watching for and he's alert to ensure his word is accomplished to those who believe. If you believe in God's word, God's watching that and he's going to confirm that. Just getting things in God, being led of God, not being presumptuous, right? Not just being led of God, um, uh, submitted to God, um, yielded to God and allow him to just order our steps. Praise God. Uh, however, we do read some warnings, even though God wants to do all those wonderful things. There are some warnings. Let's turn to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And just look here in verse 17. And it says here. Now, this is the warning. And thou say in thy heart, my power and the might of mine hand has gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that gives thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. And it shall be, if thou do it all, forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. How serious is that? That power, I've given you power. That means ability. You know, God, look, we are nothing. We were just dust. And God gives us all different abilities and giftings and so forth. And we are never to lean on the arm of the flesh, you know, but rather in humility, you know, to look to the Lord, to lead and guide us in all things. And especially concerning money. Like money can be a real bother to some people and it can cause lots of upsets. And let's turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. But if we understand it from God's point of view, what he wants to do, how he wants to do it, it just all comes together. All right. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we read here, 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10. And it says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The Amplified says, verse 10, for the love of money is a root of all evils. It is through this craving that some have been led astray and have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves through with many acute mental pangs. You know, I don't know how many people lose sleep every night over money. Actually, I was just thinking then, it's the scripture says the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. You know, the wicked worry about money all the time, how to make more money, how to make more money. And it's going to come across to the just. I can just go to bed and sleep because the wealth of the wicked is going to come across to those that are just, the righteous, God's, God's people. Just like they spoiled the Egyptians, the natural Israel, the Egyptians just wanted to, just gave. <laughs> so... It's coming, all right? It's coming. But for now, so let me just say there, it just said there, for the love of money, all right? Money in itself is not evil. It's the love of money that is evil. Money can be used for helping people, doing the gospel. It can be done for, used for many wonderful activities. But it's the love of money that's the problem. And for some people, money is their God. That, you know, that there's what scripture Jesus said, you're going to serve God or mammon, God or riches, choose. Well, we want to serve God, praise God. And, you know, also our motives regarding money must always be pure. And God sees what we already do with what we have. 
And so the question is, you know, when we, re when we receive more money, will we be willing to even give more to the gospel? Or are we just going to spend more on ourselves? Because that's basically what people spend money on themselves, material things. Oh, yes, food, bills and so forth. But it's usually their world. But God wants to lift us up, like we said, and um, the good, he's, what was the wording? Um, about giving to the gospel, his righteous cause, giving to the gospel, make a difference in somebody else's life rather than just our own. All right. Praise God. And God even notices how we treat the poor. Let's turn to Proverbs 19. Proverbs 19. Proverbs 19 and verse 17. It says, He that has pity on the poor lends unto the Lord, and that which he has given will he, the Lord, pay him again. A poor person cannot repay you. All right? So God is expecting us to be generous of heart to the poor. All right? And uh, let's go over to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, just after Proverbs. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Sorry, Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 1. And it says here, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Waters speak of people. It says that in Revelation and nations. And bread, of course, speaks of the word of God. So cast your bread upon the waters. All right. Even so, there's a principle of God that he will return whatever we're putting out. All right. Sowing and reaping. Whatever we are putting out is coming back. And so God just wants us to put it out there. And we don't always know where it's going to fi finish up. But if we're generous of heart, we put it out there because God is the one who watches over all things. Let's turn to Psalm 23. Psalm 23 and verse 1. It says here, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Amplified says, The Lord is my shepherd to feed, guide and shield me, I shall not lack. And that word want, I shall not want, that in the Hebrew it means to lack or to fail. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack, I shall not fail. And lack does not come from God. And also lack was actually under the curse and we've been redeemed from the curse of the law. We've been redeemed from the curse. So Jesus, we know, is the good shepherd. And when he is Lord of everything, when he's Lord, he will not fail us. He just wants to be Lord because everything belongs to him. God, look, God owns everything. God has everything. He created and he puts some of it into our hands and he just to see what we're going to do with it. Are we going to be wise stewards? Are we going to be careful? Are we going to be frivolous? What do we do with what we have already? All right. Does it honor God? Does it glorify God? Are we using it wisely? Are we using it uh, for fruitful activities? Um, and so on. And as believers, whatever we do in this life, every day, we are all serving the Lord. And serving God is about having a relationship with him. All right, not religion, relationship. And he desires to bless those that love him. Because it's a relationship. He's our father. And let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. And we read here, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. All right, that word rewarder, it means to remunerate, remunerate and wages. God's a rewarder. That's what that rewarder means, remunerate and wages. And God is an excellent and trustworthy employer. We are all working for God. All right, even if you're on your secular job, you know, you, the Lord, you're working for the Lord. Praise God. 
And meanwhile, let's turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 18. And it says here, For the scripture says, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Okay. Ox or oxen speak of God's ministries because they're giving out the word. The corn speaks of the word of God. They're laboring in God's word. All right. Instead of doing a secular job, they've let go of that and they're now serving God full time. They don't have any other salary. There is no other income. It's a walk of faith and they're serving the Lord. And so that reward, reward, it means payment of service. All right. The labor is worthy of his reward, payment of service, his wages. And, you know, as employees, your company gives you wages for your service. Well, so too, God allows his ministries the tithe as their wage. All right. I gave up a corporate role to do this full time. The corporate role was a very well paying job. But God said, get out of the boat and which meant walk on the water. He was going to call me to a walk of faith. So I obeyed and I've been walking ever since and he's never failed me. All right. Because it was God's calling. So I obeyed. All right. So it's all, all good. And let's turn back to First Corinthians chapter three. So God blesses you in your job and God blesses those in ministry because ev- he wants to bless everybody. He just has his way of doing it. All right. First Corinthians chapter three. God also s- We also see the word reward in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13 and 14. It says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which is his built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. The Amplified says, The work of each one will become plainly, openly known, shown for what it is. For the day of Christ will disclose and declare it because it will be real, revealed by fire. And the fire will test and critically appraise the character and the worth of the work each person has done. If the work which any person has built on this foundation, any product from his efforts, whatever, survives this test, he will get his reward. Right, the wood, hay, and stubble is going to perish, but the brass, silver, and gold will remain. All right. Again, God is the rewarder. All right. And let's turn just back to Luke and see what Jesus says here. Luke chapter 6. Meanwhile, there's a principle shown in God's word, and Jesus says it in Luke chapter 6, verse 38 Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. The Amplified says, Give and gifts will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will they pour into the pouch formed by the bosom of your robe and used as a bag. For with the measure you deal out, with the measure you use when you confer benefits on others, It will be measured back to you. But the King James says it's coming back, pressed down, shaken together, running over. So we might be putting out, but there's much more coming back. All right. Our part is to give. And God causes the increase. And when we do what God requires, he causes the return to come. And I can remember a number of years ago, Jim and I were invited over to, I think at that time it was Africa. And we were going to a number of nations in Africa and doing uh, Salvation Healing Crusades and pastor conferences. And we had to do flights, accommodation, book crusades, um, halls, transport, all manner of things. And um, the figure, I thought, I just did a bit of rough estimation. I thought, I think it's going to cost about 200000 Oh, we didn't have 200,000, like, you know. And um, anyway, so Jim and I were at a meeting. We actually were interstate at the time. We were visiting his parents in Queensland. And we were at um, a conference. We were at another church. And it came to offering time. And I thought, 200,000. Right, well, what would be a good seed? And so I thought, $2,000. Because then it would be 100 times. So I went, 
that would be okay. So I said to Jim, um, would it be all right if we put $2,000 in the offering? And he goes, no. <laughs> oh, but I've got it in my heart. I'm after the 200000 And um, And then I saw um, you could put it by Visa card because we didn't have cash on us. We could, you know, that much anyway. And we could do it by Visa card. I said, oh, Jim, we can do it on Visa card. Is that all right? And he said, no. All right. Well, Jim and I have always done things in unity. If we don't do it in unity, we don't do it at all. We wait till we're in unity. Okay. So then I said, well, Lord, I'm willing. You'll just have to speak to him. <laughs> anyway, it comes to offering time. And the person at the front doing the offering was just talking lots of things about giving and giving to the gospel and so forth. And, um, and then Jim said to me, sort of out of the side of his mouth, he says, have we got it? Like in the bank. And I said, mm, just. I think I think we generally did. We might have just had it, maybe not much more, but just. And he said, all right then. <sighs> okay, so you could fill out a card. All right, so I've got the visa card and I fill it all out and they passed a bag or a bucket or something and um, I put it in there, like believing, sewing for the 200,000, put it in there and whew, the anointing just hit me. And I thought, <gasps> that 200,000 has just left the throne room estimated time of arrival due season okay okay because we hadn't booked anything yet because we weren't going to book without cash without having the cash we wouldn't be that presumptuous anyway so um anyway so you know later that day that week okay thank you lord for the two hundred thousand. next day thank you lord for the two hundred thousand. <laughs> well i thank you lord for the two hundred thousand. And it's coming because we've got things to do. Thank you, Lord. And there's lives to be reached. And, you know, we're serving you. And thank you, Lord. And then it might have been maybe weeks or a couple of months or something. I get an email from one person. And he says, oh, hi, Deb. He, he, he's never, had never been to our church, but he, I did know him. He knew what we did. And he said, um, look, I just felt in Lord to just bless you, your ministry. And... Um, I'm just letting you know there'll be 200000 in your bank account tomorrow. The next day came, I looked at the bank account, 25, 25, 25, 25,000, 25,000, eight times, 200,000. Glory to God. Can he do it? Yes. Can he move on people? Yes. Right? It's God's way. It takes faith. It's being led of God and never presumptuous. Being led of God. But we were giving it to the gospel. It wasn't even for us even, you know. We were giving it to the gospel. And so, uh, so if you want to be a greater giver to the gospel, we'll believe God to be a greater giver. He wants to see what you're going to do with the money. You know, well, like when we were younger in the Lord, you know, and we weren't even in, um, doing as much as we're doing now, you know, we would have money or salary and so forth, and we would do things in the house and so forth like that. But then once we really got hold of giving to God's righteous cause, the gospel. Well, there was a real shift in our how we what, what we did with our money. Like we already had a house, we already had clothes. So let's just be generous to the gospel. And so we went, lives got saved, healed, reached, pastors encouraged, blah blah, all of that. Glory to God. And we met some wonderful people. And from those visits, we have had continued ongoing relationships with those pastors we connected with, and now the. Um, the topics we do are in different languages now and praise God, nothing is without purpose. And so um, God's got his hand on everyone's life and God's got the plan for your life and you don't have to be anybody else's plan. God's got a unique plan for your life and so you don't compare you ju and you don't. Uh, but the thing is with a testimony like that, well, you can be encouraged. If he can do it for me, he could do it for you. All right. And even about the property selling, you know, just... God's no respecter of persons, right? He's just looking for us to believe him. Hallelujah. All right, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You just keep believing. That's the key. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And we just read here, verse 12. It says here, For if there first be a willing mind, it is accepted according to the man has and not according to what he has not. So we didn't have 200,000, but in that instance, we had 2,000, right? So we gave what we had and we were willing, all right? That's God's just wanting us to be willing. Verse 13, for I mean that, 
that not for I mean not that other men be eased and you burden, but by the equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. Praise God. As it is written, he has gathered he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. God is looking for a willing heart and for us to yield to him what we already have. If we will just yield to him what we have, put it in his hand and say, Oh Lord, you know, and so forth. And there's just another testimony just came up. This um the man who gave us the two hundred thousand, he's a Christian man, and he had a friend who wanted to meet us for coffee. So we met this man and he said, um, so what are you doing? He didn't know too much about us, he just knew that we could be trusted. And and he said, uh, what's your next trip? And we said, oh, we're going to the Philippines. And he said, um, and so when are you going? And he said, oh, well, we're looking at um, April, May, you know, because we never hint anybody. We never tell anybody the needs because God knows. We'd, faith is not hinting. Faith is between you and God. And so this man said, um, well, so, so what, what's the hesitation? Why haven't you locked in the dates yet? <laughs> so we were asked directly and, and Jim finally said well actually we don't have the money to go just yet and he said well what do you need and Jim said um, well I think it was 27,000 because we're booking crusades and going to a number of places over there and um, and he said it'll be in your bank tomorrow really yes bring on tomorrow <laughs> so I looked in the bank there it was right just from a conversation because the favor of God God will move on people to favor you to bless you I mean it's, money doesn't come out of the sky God moves on people but you don't drop hints you don't have to drop hints but we also need to be willing because what if God's telling us me to do something for somebody else I need to obey that too it's not just a one-way thing. I have to be willing to give to others and be led of God. All right? Praise God. All right. So God's looking for us to yield what we already have. Let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and 8. It says here, But I say unto you, he that sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he which sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. We're not, we're not going to be grudging. We're not going to be out of compulsion or compunction just because someone's saying, oh, you've got to put some money in and, and uh, people are watching. No, we've got to be willing. Verse 8, and then God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Preaching the gospel is a good work. And so God's always going to make a way where we're able to do that. And I'd like to read it from the Amplified, verse 6. Remember this, that he who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also reap sparingly and grudgingly. All right? Whatever the way you sow is how you're going to reap. If you don't sow much, well, perhaps there's not much coming back. All right? Or if you show, sow um, grudgingly, well, I don't think there's much coming back at all. All right, because God won't receive it. He's looking for our willingness. And he who sows generously that blessings may come to someone will also reap generously and with the blessings. I just remembered the back part of that story of that last man who sowed the 27,000. That day he said he'll, he'll put the 27,000 in. That afternoon he went back to his office and he had a sale for $270,000. Exactly 10 times, exactly 10 times the amount that he promised to us like he sowed generously and he reaped generously praise God and verse 7 let each one give as he's made up his own mind and purposed in his heart not reluctantly or sorrowfully or under compulsion for God loves he takes pleasure in and prizes above other things and is unwilling to abandon or to do without a cheerful joyous prompt to do it giver whose heart is in his giving all right and when we do it that way verse 8 and God is able to make all grace every favor and earthly blessing come to you in abundance 
so that you may always and under all circumstances and whatever you need be self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support or furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. Praise God. Praise God. Can he do it? Yes. Yes. I've proved it in my own life. He's so faithful and he just wants us to be willing and obedient. And I'll just turn over to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. And it says here, verse 7, and it says here, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to his flesh, like this natural world, shall of the flesh reap corruption, because everything here is going to perish. It run, wears out, it rusts out. But he who sows to the Spirit, the things of God, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season... We shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Praise God. And I'm going to read it from the Amplified, verse 7. And it says, Do not be deceived and dis deluded and misled. God will not allow himself to be sneered at, scorned, disdained or mocked by mere pretensions or professions or by his precepts being set aside. He inevitably deludes himself who attempts to delude God. For whatever a man sows, that and that only is what he will reap. For he who sows to his own flesh, his lower nature, sensuality, will from the flesh reap decay and ruin and destruction. But he who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. And let us not lose heart and grow weary and faint in acting nobly and doing right. For in due time and at the appointed season, we shall reap. If we do not loosen or relax our courage and faint, that means we, that, so we don't give up. You never give up. You just keep believing. Verse 10. So that, so then as occasion and opportunity open to us, let us do good morally to all people, not only being useful or profitable to them, but also doing what is for their spiritual good and advantage. Be mindful to be a blessing, especially to those of the household of faith, those who belong to God's family with you, the believers. Praise God. Praise God. And God knows your situation. And let's turn to Mark chapter 10. Matthew, Mark chapter 10. And Jesus said in verse 27, and Jesus looking up upon them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. I don't know any bank or any financial institution that can give you a uh, that percentage of 2,000 and getting 200,000 back. There is no bank that does that rate of interest rate. None. Investment and return. And the house thing, investment and return. Nothing. Just... So God is fast. God's financial system is far more superior than any man's natural system. All right. I'm just going to, because all with God, all things are possible. I just want to look at an example in Numbers chapter 17, nearly there. Numbers 17, Numbers 17. God blesses unity. And there was a situation here in Numbers between Moses and the people from the 12 tribes. People, they were coming against and even murmuring against Moses and the leadership. And then God told Moses what to do. Chap chapter 17, verse 1. And it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take of every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers, all their princes according to the house of their fathers. Twelve rods, write thou every man's name upon his rod. And thou shalt write Aaron's name, he was the high priest, name upon the rod of Levi. For one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers. And thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony where I will meet with you. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom. 
and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, and every one of their princes gave him a rod apiece. For each priest, each prince won according to their father's houses, even twelve rods. And the rod of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. And it came to pass that on the morrow, Moses went into the tabernacle. So this is the next day. Tabernacle of witness. And behold, the rod of Aaron from the house of Levi, that's the priesthood, was budded and brought forth buds, bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. And Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord unto the children of Israel. And they looked and took every man his rod. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebels. And thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me that they, that they die not. Okay. We must not limit God. Because with God, all things are possible. And God can do anything, even make a stick overnight to bud, blossom and bring forth almonds, fruit. <laughs> overnight, there's nothing impossible with God. And as I said, God knows your situation and things can change overnight like one day I didn't have the 200,000 and the next day there it was or you know or sometimes you know you're believing 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 and then there it is right and our part is to know that nothing is impossible for those that believe God nothing because with God all things are possible praise God and it says here, in, um, I'll, I'll just read it. It says here in Proverbs 23, verse 4, Labor not to be rich. Cease from thy own wisdom, the Amplified says. Weary not yourself to be rich. Cease from your own human wisdom. All right? Uh, so many people go after the money and it can cause such a weariness. And let's turn to Mark chapter 4. And we know from reading the parable of the sower and the seed, you know, there were different hearts that Jesus mentioned. And one of them was a thorny heart. And just down in Mark chapter 4, Jesus gave the interpretation, verse 18. And these are they which are sown among the thorns, such as hear the word. So they're in church. They are hearing the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. The Amplified says, verse 18, And the ones sown among the thorns are others who hear the word. Then the cares and anxieties of the world and the distractions of the age and the pleasure and delight and false glamour and deceitfulness of riches and the craving and passionate desire for other things creep in and they choke and suffocate the word and it becomes fruitless. They hear the word, so they're in church. But unfortunately, the thorny heart person experienced deceitfulness of riches and it choked. They went after the riches and it choked the life of God and they became unfruitful. And a testimony I know of a believer, this lady, and she was going really well in the Lord. She was growing and just really good. But then she decided she wanted to earn some more money. And so she took a second job. And unfortunately, the second job started to take up more of her time. And I'm not sure about her personal Bible study and so forth, but publicly, she started missing the prayer meeting. And then she was missing the Bible study. She was getting tired. You know, she was tired. She's, you know, she's distracted with the other jobs. And then she was finally missing with from the Sunday meetings. And then just out of church, just not seen at all. Not seen at all. Because she was doing well, she had a job, she was going well, but she just got distracted. She wanted more money. She wanted to go after other things. 
Other things are not worth losing your life in God, your life in God. And so we need to settle it in our heart to go after God and not money. Yes, we need money to put food on the table and so forth and bills to pay, but it's not everything, not at the cost of our life in God. The things of God are eternal. The things of this world are only temporal. Okay, and Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, and it says verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. The Amplified says, and my God with, will liberally supply, fill to the full your every need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. He's God and God knows what we need. And let's turn over to Matthew chapter 6. I think this is almost the last. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. God knows what we need. Matthew 6. And let's just verse 25. And it says here, this is Jesus speaking. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, and what shall we drink, and wherewith shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. And then we read verse 33, but seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that's his right ways, and all these things, all the things that you need shall be added unto you. Praise God, the Amplified 33 says, but seek, aim at and strive after first of all his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right. And then all these things taken together will be given you Besides, praise God, when we seek God first, the other things will be added to our life. Hallelujah. And last scripture, Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11 and verse 22. And we read here. And Jesus answering said unto him, have faith in God. Hallelujah. Amplified says, verse 22, and Jesus replying said unto him, have faith in God constantly. Constantly. You know, in faith, out of faith, in faith, out of faith, double-minded, will he, won't he, will I, shall I? No, 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 no. Have faith constantly. And you know, he, um, Abraham, he was fully persuaded that what God had promised he would fulfill and it says, by faith and patience, he inherited. By faith and patience. We cannot snap our fingers to God. It's faith and patience that we go the way of God. So our trust, so have faith in God constantly. Our trust, our confidence and expectation need to be in God. Also, God desires to enlarge our faith. So our confidence, trust and ex expectation in him are growing from faith to faith. God wants to enlarge your faith. When you first get born again, your faith is this big, but the more word you hear, faith comes by hearing the word, the more your faith is in, in getting enlarged. All right, so you might believe God for this, but then next time you'll believe God for this, and the next time you can believe God for this. We are to enlarge our faith, all right? 
And, and, fi oh, sorry, and finally, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And verse 5, it says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, right? It's not in ourselves. It's not in the flesh. It's not in people. It's in God. Our faith is in God. And verse 9, it says, but, I, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. And the Amplified says, but on the contrary, as the scripture says, what eye has not seen and ear has not heard and has not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared, made and keeps ready for those who love him, who hold him in affectionate reverence, promptly obeying him and gratefully recognizing the benefits he has bestowed. Praise God. Praise God. So in summary, to receive God's financial blessing, our part is to give thanks for what we already have, continue to believe God's word and to obey God's word and so receive all that God has for us. And everyone said, Amen.